hand it over to Mr. Allen. Okay, thanks, Tony. And about the convention in August, please remember that uh, everyone can register. It, there's no cost to register. You don't have to be a league member to register. And we have $8,000 in door prizes at this convention. So uh, please sign up and join us. We have great speakers. Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell from Oxford University, Richard God from Princeton, uh, Brian Haydet, uh, very enthusiastic uh, YouTube uh, presenter. He's got a PhD in materials engineering from out at Santa Barbara and just Dave Iker, Kelly Beatty, just lots of incredible speakers. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Uh, you'll join us for that. Uh, our guest tonight is um, Bob King and what happened to my screen here? It disappeared. Tony? Tony, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I oh, can hear okay. you. Okay, for some reason the screen disappeared, I'm sorry. Our guest tonight is uh, Bob King. You probably know him because he has a very famous blog called Astro Bob. <laughs> it is well known throughout the country and beyond. And he's been a regular guest on our Global Star Parties as well. He spent 39 years as a photojournalist and photo editor for the Duluth T uh, News Tribune uh, and is a regular uh, teacher of community education and astronomy at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, he writes for Sky and Telescope magazine and for its website and he is an author. He's written a number of books, some of which you may be familiar with, uh, Night Sky with the Naked Eye, also Wonders of the Night Sky You Must See Before You Die, and Urban Legends uh, of space. Uh, his talk tonight's on meteorites. I have heard this talk. It's fantastic. It's uh, entitled Meteorites, Time Travelers from the Infinite Solar System. Bob, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chuck. I appreciate, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, it's great to meet a few of the folks as we get started. So um, yeah, I here in Duluth, Minnesota. I'm hoping that my internet connection will be stable sometimes at night tends to break down a little, so hang in there with me and uh, we'll make it through. Feel free, by the way, if you're muted during this, if you have a question, you just feel like you must ask, go right ahead and unmute and drop in, or obviously you can use the chat box too. So I'm gonna be talking this evening about some of my favorite friends from the sky. Here's one of them right here. This is a uh, Campo del Cielo meteorite, and it's pretty heavy. It's a, a little more than a kilo and a half, and it would do a lot of damage to my head or to my knee if I happened to drop this meteorite. This is an iron nickel meteorite, and iron nickel meteorites are some of the most familiar meteorites, though they are by far not the most common. Most people think of a big chunk of iron as a meteorite, but stony meteorites are far more common. But the iron nickel ones are impressive. If you ever have an astronomy club meeting and you're doing outreach, having a nice big meteorite to pass around really evokes the wow factor in your, uh, the people attending. So we're gonna hopefully get a little wow factor for you here from my program. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll go right to the program. Um, can somebody tell me whether they can see this okay? Should see a yes. meteor. Yes, it's good. It's good. Great, thank you. That's good, and it looks sharp. I hope too. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about meteorites, time travelers from the infant solar system. Meteorites are extremely ancient. You know, as I get older, and people think I become more ancient. I will be forever youthful compared to any meteorite that I might pick up. Virtually every single meteorite that you see that you might buy uh, is about four and a half billion years old. And some of the materials in meteorites come from stars directly, literally stardust. And some of those materials are even older, up to 7 billion years old. Uh, when we go out at night and you look up at the night sky, you often see meteors. We're out observing Messier objects or whatever, but you know we'll look up and see a flash go by uh, just virtually any night of the year. And on the night of August 11th and 12th, which is coming up pretty quickly here, we're going to have the Perseid meteor shower. It should be a spectacular show because there's no moon out really to wreck the shower. So we should see it at its very best peak. And that'll be on the night 
of August 11th and 12th. And those Perseids, like virtually all of the other small meteors that we see, are actually pieces, tiny fragments from comets. When it comes to the Perseids, we've identified the comet as Comet Swift-Tuttle. That's the parent comet of the meteor shower. These are very small particles that completely burn up, vaporize in the upper atmosphere. And to date, uh, no one has recovered a meteorite from a meteor shower. Again, the emphasis here being that these are very small objects. Uh, occasionally, though, a very brilliant meteor will pass through the sky and it will land on the ground as meteorites. These materials are stronger, larger. They're able to make it through the atmosphere as this meteor, which became a meteorite, did on April 22nd, 2012. There was a daytime fireball. Incredibly, uh, a photographer captured an image of this. Uh, it made it through the atmosphere and meteorites landed on the Earth at Sutter's Mill, California. And it was a very rare carbonaceous chondrite that landed. And they're famous because they contain water, they've got amino acids, uh, you know, potential precursors to life, and they have seeded Earth with the chemistry needed for life to begin. Here's a lucky fellow named Jason who found himself one of those little Sutter's Mill meteorites, or you can see the dark fusion crust around it from uh, the heat of the atmosphere, roasting the outer millimeter or so of the meteorite. And the origin of these solid objects that make it through the atmosphere to land on the ground is basically, they're basically asteroids. And these are some wonderful images of asteroids taken by visiting and flyby spacecraft. There's also a few comets down here. If you look at the bottom, there's Pirelli, Temple One, Halley, and so forth. But we see that these are the actual bodies. These are large stony or metallic objects or sometimes a mix of both stone and metal. And they are the originators of the material that lands on the earth that we find, that we analyze, and that helps understand how the planets form. Here's a wonderful image. We've, I'm sure you guys have been following uh, NASA's osiris Mex. Rex, uh, <laughs> Rex mission to asteroid Bennu. Bennu is just a really small asteroid, very typical since most of these things are small bodies. It's located between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. The OSIRIS-REx craft is on its way back to the Earth to deliver, give or take about 60 grams of this material, which will arrive on September 24th, 2023. It will drop a capsule through the atmosphere and land on the ground. This is a very expensive mission, but uh, it's a lot cheaper to just wait and have a meteorite land on the Earth, but it's extra special because we're identifying the body from which the asteroid, from which the meteorite came from. So we're in situ, so to speak, when we visit an asteroid. So it's worth the extra money. The asteroids, uh, again, as you probably well know, uh, there are two different asteroid belts. We're going to concentrate on the one that's closer to us and is responsible for the majority of the meteorites that land on our planet. That is the main belt that's located between Mars and Jupiter. As of March 2021, we have data. Uh, we've discovered and have data on not quite a million of these things, 930,000 asteroids. Also in this diagram, you can see the Trojan asteroids which are families of asteroids that lie on either side of Jupiter at the uh, Lagrange points in its orbit. But again, we'll be dealing with mostly the asteroid belt, the one you learned about when you were a kid when you first studied astronomy. One of the interesting things about the asteroid belt is that many diagrams will show it as saturated with asteroids, but there's actually gaps in there called Kirkwood gaps. And these gaps are at resonant points. They are at special orbits. Within these resonant points, there are few to no asteroids. And the reason for that is because Jupiter pumps up the energy of any object that has a period, its period around the sun, that is a fraction, a simple fraction of Jupiter's orbital period. Okay, let me just explain that. So if an asteroid revolves around the sun three times, as you see here with the three to one resonance, for every Jupiter orbit, 
Jupiter, the repeated passage of the asteroid will eventually shift its position, pump up its energy and alter its orbit until it leaves that particular spot. Okay, and that begins to create a gap. Every asteroid at the three to one resonance eventually leaves that area and leaves this kind of open gap in the ring. Then there's five to two, five orbits of the asteroid for two of Jupiter, seven to three and so forth. So you get these interesting gaps where the asteroids do not stick around. Instead, they get pushed out by Jupiter. It's the very same thing. I was trying to think of a good example of resonance and a great example is just when you push a child on a swing. If you wait for the swing to come back at just the right moment and give it a push, the swing and the child will just fly out and you'll keep increasing the energy and the swing goes higher and higher and higher. It's because you're in resonance with that swing. Well, if you want to picture this person over here as Jupiter, Jupiter is doing the pushing, so to speak, and it's imparting energy at just the right point in the orbit of those asteroids at those particular gaps, those Kirkwood gaps, and it's pushing it out of the gap. So what happens is that here's uh, my hapless asteroid here, kind of stuck between these gaps. It's in a, and it knows what its fate is. It's headed out and into a different orbit. And here's what happens. Over time, the planet Jupiter will change the orbit of that asteroid from being circular or nearly circular, we'll say. It will stretch, it will cause the orbit to become more eccentric or elongated. So it goes from more of a circle to more elongated as it gets pumped up by energy from Jupiter as it goes round and round in that resonance spot. As the orbit becomes elongated, it, one end of it gets closer to the sun than the other. And that can bring it near the Earth. So you start with an asteroid that's, you know, out there in the asteroid belt, but Jupiter's gravity kicks it into an orbit over time that gets stretched out into an elongated ellipse, which can bring it closer to the sun. And the good part is it could bring it close enough to the Earth to intersect with our orbit and potentially strike the planet as a meteorite, right? So we get showers of meteorites. So Jupiter is, it's not completely responsible, but it's largely responsible for removing asteroids from these particular spots within the asteroid belt, changing their orbits so that they extend downward towards the Earth, which increases the possibility that there's gonna be an encounter between our planet and that object in the future and we'll see it break up in the atmosphere and potentially leak meteorites. So Jupiter's kind of the home buster out there. And uh, this comic kind of shows you that a little bit. There's, there it's gone, it's gone and done it again, pitched an asteroid towards the planet. Now, interesting things can happen. Uh, when an asteroid gets removed from that resonance orbit, begins to migrate across the asteroid belt, it can strike another asteroid, right? And so this creates a whole bunch of smaller asteroidettes, these little tinier bodies. These in turn can drift into one of those resonant orbits and then be booted again by Jupiter. So this is a self-perpetuating process. Once something gets removed, it can strike another, create more asteroids, which create further possibilities for objects to come near the Earth and land here. Uh, there's tons and tons of evidence of this happening. If you cut open meteorites, you'll often see this webbing inside the meteorite. These are called shock veins. And this is material that has melted because something has struck the asteroid. In the collision, great heat and shock is generated. And that reveals itself or expresses itself as these shock veins of melted uh, minerals rich with sulfides within the meteorite itself. So that's just direct evidence. If you ever see a shock vein meteorite, you're holding, you, you're almost, you can almost feel with your imagination what it must have been like millions of years ago, there was a collision that ultimately brought that here. And here's evidence, here's a fingerprint of that collision. 
There's another way too. You guys have heard of the Yarkovsky effect, which is a word I love saying. One of the things about astronomy that's a joy is just some of the terminology, and this is one of them. The Yarkovsky effect can alter an asteroid's orbit as well and cause that asteroid's orbit to elongate, which will bring it near the Earth, or it can move it into one of those resonant gaps like we saw earlier. And it's basically a very simple thing. It's a very minor, minor effect, but it adds up over time. Here's an asteroid. It's revolving around the sun, which is off here to the right. And this asteroid is revolving in the prograde direction, which means it's moving, it's, it's spinning in the same direction that it's revolving around the sun. That's called prograde. This asteroid is revolving in retrograde motion. So it's spinning opposite to the direction. I can't do it with my hands very well, so pardon me. It's uh, revolving in the direction opposite to its orbital motion. Let's go back to the prograde one. We have the sun beating down on this asteroid, just like it is where we live. It gets really hot in the afternoon. Well, the sun, the asteroid really gets hot. The surface heats up to its highest temperature late in the afternoon, after the morning, and the, you know, the heat builds up. This creates a little bit of a thrust effect. It, pushing the asteroid, that heat leaving it is almost like a tiny rocket thruster. And that causes the spin when it comes to an asteroid revolving in the same direction as its orbit, that causes the orbit to become larger. That object then moves a little bit away from the sun. It drifts into a larger, wider orbit. Exactly the opposite happens when the uh, heated hemisphere of the asteroid uh, the thruster effect there slows it down just a little bit and it drops in toward the sun. So over millennia and actually millions of years, an asteroid, even a small one, and this affects mostly small objects, really no larger than about 30 to 40 uh, kilometers. These asteroids can drift into places where they can get booted by Jupiter or just on their own fall into an orbit that might intersect that of the Earth's, which would bring it right to us. Uh, the asteroid Bennu I showed you earlier from the NASA mission, that is experiencing the Yarkovsky effect. And I think I've got the amount down here uh, to the effect of it speeding up at the rate of one second per century. Pretty doggone slow, but obviously nature has, if nothing else, it has an abundance of time. And over millions of years, the asteroid's orbit can change greatly. Here's a great example of an asteroid that used to live in the asteroid belt, uh, most likely several million years ago, moved into a resonance point, was uh, its orbit was gradually elongated from something from closer to a circle to what you see here. And this is the orbit of the Chelyabinsk asteroid or the Chelyabinsk impact or the one that came down over Russia back at on February 15, 2013. That's when it impacted the Earth. For many revolutions, it missed the Earth. It came close to the Earth, but it never intersected. And then eventually the paths crossed. And when they crossed, this thing entered the Earth's atmosphere. And wow, what an event it was. You remember the pictures, you know, the uh, dash cams were a big deal in Russia. They probably still are. And so many people recorded this. You can go to YouTube if you haven't already and look up lots of different videos. This came in at a very shallow angle. This was a huge object before it touched the Earth's atmosphere. This thing was as big as a six story building. All right. And then when it came down into the atmosphere, the speed of the Chelyabinsk impactor, which was around 40 to 45,000 miles per hour. Okay, that was its celestial speed. It hits the air and it would, when it reached an altitude of around 14 miles, the pressure uh, of the impact of that asteroid with the air just made it explode into pieces and sent this huge shock wave, which blasted all kinds of windows, lots of buildings. Uh, it was almost 3,000 different buildings suffered damage as a result of that shock wave from the airburst of the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite. The blast was equivalent to 400 to 500 kilotons of TNT. There was a, one big chunk, there were several other larger chunks, but 
the uh, explosion blew this thing up into so many tiny pieces. And uh, these started showing up, by the way, within weeks on eBay, all these little blackened bits of the Chelyabinsk meteorites. And of course, that blackness, again, is fusion crust around the meteorite, which is caused by heating in approximately the outer millimeter of stone. This is an LL chondrite, a low metal chondrite, it's called. And when it was cut open, it shows lots and lots of shock veins. Here's another shot of just how small a meteorite can be and still show ablation and uh, orientation from flight. Look at this thing. This is fusion crust. Here's a penny. And this meteorite is, you can just barely hold it on your fingertip and it's shaped just like the Apollo moon capsule from flying through the atmosphere so rapidly, even at this small size, just incredible to think of the energies involved in an event like this. Uh, here's uh, the broken windows. Uh, uh, people eventually started selling broken window glass from this event on eBay, along with a small sample of the meteorite. Of course, the Chelyabin's fall uh, is one of many, many meteorite falls. There are approximately, give or take, but there are about 10 meteorite falls per year that are witnessed, call them witnessed falls. Of course, many, many more rocks from space fall to the earth that are unwitnessed because so much of the earth is covered in ocean or it's you know out in the Arctic where no one lives or something like that. But uh, witness falls, roughly 10. Uh, here's another very famous, very famous fall. This happened in Silicaga, Georgia, November 30th, 1954. An 8.5 pound meteorite came through the roof of uh, Ann Hodges. She was renting this house. That's Ann down there. The police came to investigate, went right through the roof. She is one of the very, very few people who was ever struck by a meteorite. We don't have any evidence that anyone's ever been killed by a meteorite, but there have been at least a couple of people hit. She was probably the most seriously injured of anyone. And again, that happened in 1954. There's the whole, here's the doctor examining Miss Hodges. The meteorite came through the ceiling, hit the floor, bounced off one of those big old radio consoles that people had back in the 40s and 50s, bounced off that thing and struck her right there in the thigh and created that big bruise. Here's another wonderful fall. This was back on December 10th, 1984. Nothing like speedy delivery, huh? Cosmically fast, right into the mailbox there. <laughs> that one in Georgia back in 1984. By the way, you will still see small slices of these meteorites show up every so often on a meteorite dealer's website or on eBay. Very small pieces. And of course, they are expensive because of their fame. Meteorites become more famous the more things they hit. If they go through a roof. People will ask more money for that meteorite than if it just landed on the ground. This was a very scary situation back in 2003 in Park Forest, Illinois, which is a southern suburb of Chicago. March 26, Robert Garza, here he is, explaining what happened that night. <coughs> he was in bed, had just gone to bed, but he was nearly struck by a 5.1 pound um, chondrite meteorite, a stony meteorite at 11.30 at night. And you could see it it came through the ceiling up above and then it struck the windowsill. You can see the damage done there and then it slammed down into the room very close to him. So it was a very close call, that meteorite fall. Uh, meteorites, as I mentioned, they do fall all the time. The larger the object is, the, the rarer it is. So uh, small meteorites and certainly dust comes down by the ton every day across the planet, cosmic dust, you know, just little pieces of comet uh, by the tons. And then there's those witness falls, but then there's occasionally across thousands and tens of thousands of years, uh, the probability increases that a large fall will occur as it did about 50,000 years ago in Northern Arizona east of Flagstaff, there's Meteor Crater there. I recommend a visit if you can get out there anytime. It's just huge, this crater. 
And of course, it used to be bigger because it's filled in with some silt and stuff like that. There used to be a lake there and so on, but it is enormous and it and, and one of the very best preserved meteor craters on Earth. A wonderful place to stand near the rim and just sort of try to picture in, in your mind the enormity, the catastrophe that happened 50,000 years ago in what is now the Arizona desert. Uh, this is the largest meteorite ever found on Earth so far, and it's in Namibia. It weighs 60 tons. It is an iron nickel meteorite, and it's called the Hoba iron, and that was discovered early last century. Uh, the area was dug out around it, and now it's become kind of a park where you can go and visit it in Namibia. There are a variety of different types of meteorites. I'm not gonna talk about each different kind. We're just gonna talk about the major divisions, all right? I mentioned earlier that th these were kind of the most familiar, the iron nickel. We're talking about an iron nickel alloy, all right? It's not pure iron, it's not pure nickel, but you've got different proportions of those two elements together that form crystals inside the meteorite. Here you can see the outer coating. <clears throat> There's been some weathering, obviously. Uh, meteorites that are made out of iron nickel often contain what are called inclusions of graphite, uh, the same material that's used to make pencils, pencil lead. Meteorites, no matter where you pick them up, they are all, as I mentioned earlier, virtually the same age, four and a half billion years old. So they are the oldest materials that you and I are ever going to get our hands on. And again, something that ancient, when you give it to someone and they hold on to it and and it's so unusual anyway to have a big honking piece of iron, they could be transported in time. So that's why to me, they seem like almost like time machines in a sense. When you cut open one of these iron nickel meteorites and you etch it with nitric acid, uh, you will see that it reveals, it, first you polish it up so it's just shiny metal. And then when you apply the acid alcohol mixture, it reveals crystals that are called tannite and camasite. These are crystals of nickel, iron nickel. And they're in a particular sort of pattern we call the Widmanstetten pattern. And this is a unique pattern to meteorites. If you have a suspect chunk of metal and you can get it cut and you can etch it with this acid and you see this pattern, guaranteed that is a cosmic object in your hand. That came from the asteroid belt that is unique to the meteorites. Uh, that structure forms <clears throat> in the iron uh, core of an asteroid as it slowly cools in a small asteroid under very slow, long cooling conditions. Check this guy out. <laughs> this is a, I had to throw this photo in. This guy's name is Tim Heights, meteorite collector. I don't know what he's up to these days, but here he is, he's sitting on top of a, the biggest piece of Campo del Cielo, this meteorite. And this thing weighs 37 tons. Can you imagine that? Well, you don't. There, you don't have to. It's right there. Uh, Campo del Cielo meteorite <coughs> possibly landed uh, roughly 5,000 years ago uh, in Argentina, and that's where it's from. And this is where this particular meteorite is right now. This big monster, and you can go down to that park and learn about meteorites in Argentina. There's multiple craters created by this iron nickel asteroid that entered Earth's atmosphere and broke up into pieces. And so there's actually a crater field across, I, I don't know what the distance is, but across a section of Argentina. These are often considered the most beautiful of the meteorites. They're called palisites uh, after a Russian scientist named Pallas and he first studied these meteorites. And what they are is a wonderful combination of iron and nickel, which you see here, the metal matrix, and olivine crystals. And depending upon how much water and oxygen has worked its way into a meteorite, and these are very damaging things, by the way, in outer space, these are essentially pristine materials. Obviously, the exterior of an asteroid is bombarded by cosmic rays and the solar wind and it's altered. But beneath that crust, you have very pristine ancient materials, the same as they were four and a half billion years ago. You put that thing down on the earth and the oxygen and water 
uh, will eventually cause that thing to rot. It'll rust, the crystals will darken. This is a beautiful sample showing really classic green olivine crystals. Here's another palisite. This is called Brahin. This is from Russia. And you can kind of see some of the crystals in there. They're much darker, aren't they? And that's because they've been oxidized, all right, through their life on Earth. Earth is unkind to meteorites, but they're gorgeous with that beautiful mix. Uh, most common of all the meteorites are the stony chondrites, all right? And chondrites get their name from chondrules, which is a word that means seed or seed-like. And chondrules are these little round things here. And since this is a slice, chondrules are actually like tiny marbles. So you're getting a slice through the meteorite. But I've got a picture coming up that'll show you just the chondrules by themselves. The composition of a chondrite, uh, it, it looks and kind of feels like a meteor, or pardon me, like a rock on the earth, except that chondrites, in addition to chondrules, also contain a fair amount of metal, just not chunky metal. It's, I don't know if you can see this. We'll give it a try and I'll show it to you again later. Do you see the sparkles here on the surface? I see some nods. That's great. Thanks, guys. Uh, those are flecks of iron and nickel. Iron and nickel is ubiquitous in many types of meteorites. So these are composed of silicates primarily, olivine and peroxine. These are materials you would found, find in the bottom of Earth's crust or in the mantle of the planet or even in the crust. So there's continuity here. We're made out of meteorites. You know, our planet ultimately was made out of these things. And uh, you'll also find the similar minerals on Earth. Meteorites have some unusual minerals, though, that you do not find on the Earth. There's also iron and nickel, iron sulfide, and again, it contains chondrules. Let's take a look at some of those dudes. Look at these little guys. How beautiful. Just tiny marbles. There's a scale cube in the background, 10 millimeters, one centimeter cube. So these are small. They're easily visible to the eye when you just hold the slice up. Quite beautiful to look at under the microscope, especially if you can get a thin section of a chondrite meteorite and look at it under crossed polarized light in a geological microscope type setup. Oh my God, it looks like stained glass. I should have included a photo. Forgive me, I did not. These chondrules are fascinating. When you hold a chondrite and you see those little circles in there, you are seeing what is likely the, some of the very first material to condense from the solar nebula. Back in the days, four and a half billion years ago, when there were no planets, when it was just the nebula itself, the nebula had iron and nickel flecks, it had tiny bits of silicates in it, sulfur, it had all the different elements and all of these things gathered in space, collapsed into this cloud, which eventually spun down, flattened, and within it, the planets formed. All of this material was belched out billions of years earlier by previous generations of stars. All right, the main sources of all of this stuff was novae. You know, when there's a nova explosion, that material gets shot out into space. Supernovae, they create their own lots of different elements and then spread them into space during the explosive event. Planetary nebula, white dwarfs can even contribute. And then of course, red giants like Betelgeuse, or red super giants like Betelgeuse, Antares, and even red giants, yes, um, <clears throat> like our sun will become in the future. These materials go out into space, gradually come together again and form new solids. And these are the the essence, I guess you'd say, the basics of meteorites. And the first material to form, besides just the fine dust that I was talking about that came from the stars, there was apparently, uh, roughly four and a half billion years ago, some kind of flash heating event. Uh, it may have been a, a gigantic lightning type bolts shooting through the solar nebula, maybe enormous flares from the sun but something caused this material to suddenly heat up to very high temperatures across the developing solar system. And it heated up, melted, and congealed into these little spherical droplets. Of course, they're spherical because you're in outer space, right? So they can just 
turn into spheres. And it's those small objects that gradually gathered together to form larger objects, which then glommed onto each other gravitationally, that became the seeds of planets called protoplanets. This is a very crude diagram, but it kind of shows you the precursor dust ball there. And then it becomes a molten droplet and that uh, becomes a chondral. So chondrules uh, went on ultimately to form the protoplanets. Uh, this is just a, another picture of a chondrite. It's angled to show the iron nickel flakes there. Some of them are just beautiful. They can look like the best starry sky that you've ever seen in your life. Just hold it right and you get that effect. Where do these things come from? Well, we've used spectroscopy here on the Earth to study different asteroids to see if we can find a match to the meteoric materials we have on the Earth, what we have in our collections. And a very good match uh, between the H chondrites, like this one that I showed you early with all the sparkle, we found a very good match with the asteroid Hebe. So it may be the parent body for the H chondrite family of meteorites, which is a very common one. If you uh, go online or do any kind of purchasing of meteorites, you'll see H chondrites out there frequently. And just by chance, I had to mention this, Hebe is at opposition, what is that, tomorrow night, Saturday night? It'll be a magnitude 8.4 in Aquila. So if you want to, one of the pleasures of getting into meteorites is that you can have a slice of one in your hand and go outside and look at the object in your telescope and you can tell your friends, here, now hold on to this. We're going to be looking at this right now in our telescope. Probably the most famous, best known, most exciting, let's say, class of meteorites are the carbonaceous chondrites. They are also made of silicates. They've got sulfides but they also have clay-like materials. Okay, water has been percolating through these parent body asteroids sometime in the past, and it altered the mineralogy of the rocks. So we have clay-like minerals, we've got carbon, there is water in these meteorites. And one potential parent body for the carbonaceous chondrites is the asteroid 2 Pallas, which is one of the larger, brighter asteroids also easily visible in a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. So these are real connections that we make here between these objects that you can hold in your hand and something you can see in the sky. And the more of that we can do as amateurs, especially with the public, uh, I think uh, the better connection sometimes people can make to space. It's one way to make a nice cosmic connection, so to speak. Uh, then we have the achondrites. Achondrites means no chondrules. The chondrules are gone. These are igneous rocks and they come from, they can be lava flows on the surface of an asteroid or they could be mantle material beneath the crust. The origin for many of the achondrites uh, is Vesta and we have a very good lock on that because the NASA's Dawn mission went to Vesta and carefully studied the mineralogy and, uh, and mapped it carefully from orbit. And it's a very close match between achondrite meteorites and what Vesta is made out of. And if you remember, let's see, I think I've got a picture of it here. Here it is, there's our orbiting asteroid, 329 miles across. Look at the bottom of this thing. There was an enormous impact there at the South Pole of Vesta that totally blasted off pieces of this thing into outer space. It left a central peak, you can see it right there. And it's believed that potentially some of the pieces that we have in our collection originated from that long ago impact event that excavated the asteroid's south polar region. Incredible, isn't it? Just incredible part of the history and story of our solar system. And we can't leave talking about meteorites without talking about lunar meteorites because we've also identified quite a few of those Right now we know of 452 different lunar meteorites have been classified. Their composition is primarily plagioclase feldspar. They have silicates. Uh, they've also got little flecks of iron and nickel in them because the meteorites land on the moon and that material gets mixed in with everything else. One of the primary uh, characteristics of lunar meteorites, no surprise, 
is that they are brecciated, which means that they are all broken up into pieces. Look at all these little bits and pieces. And that's because the moon has been continuously bombarded across the history of the solar system. You know, it doesn't have the type of erosional effects that the Earth has, and it has very little to no atmosphere. And so over time, uh, the material has just been beat up, battered, ground up, crushed, and it becomes this brecciated mix like you see in front of you. This is a very classic texture. And we can be sure that this is a lunar rock, not an Earth rock, or from somewhere else, because of the particular composition of it, uh, the fact that there's certain types of cosmic ray exposures done on it. We have Apollo rocks, many pounds of them, uh, with which to compare potential lunar meteorites. And it's also very feasible uh, physically to get a meteorite from the moon to the earth with a powerful impact. So when you look at these giant craters like Tycho or Clavius, Copernicus, those enormous impacts can launch material directly towards the Earth or into orbit around the Earth, and some of that eventually landing on our planet and being found centuries later when we know what to look for. Same with Mars. The enormous impacts on Mars can launch material into space, eventually to be intercepted at Earth as a meteorite. A composition, once again, the familiar silicate materials, very common on the Earth, common in Martian meteorites, plagioclase, and so forth. These little black spots there, those are shock features. So they formed during either the impact itself or perhaps there was another impact that broke that original object that launched from Mars, broken into smaller pieces. This landed in Morocco in July of 2011. And we want to talk again about ages. Chondrules are roughly 4.56 billion years old, those little round uh, marbles in meteorites. The oldest material that we've discovered in meteorites, which would be the first to form in the solar nebula, the, the thing that uh, would form even under very hot conditions, those are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions or CAIs. This is 4.567 billion years old give or take, right? Very ancient materials. This particular meteorite is called Allende, and this fell in 1969. So here's the big picture. Each of these pieces of meteorites that's delivered willy-nilly to our planet, courtesy of Jupiter, courtesy of collisions, the Arkofsky effect, things that take time, these represent different parts of asteroids. And when you put the whole picture together, you get something like this. First, let's look at an evolution of an asteroid or a protoplanet. We have chondrules coming together, all right, sticking together, whether it's an electrostatic type force or stickiness itself. And then these stick to other materials that are orbiting near them at approximately the same speed. And then that becomes large enough to begin to gravitationally pull in more stuff. At a certain point, there's a lot of material there. And within that material are radioactive isotopes. And there's a particular one, an aluminum isotope in the early days of the solar system that would have provided enough heat through radioactive decay to actually melt the interior of asteroids, modest sized asteroids. When you melt the interior of an asteroid, it becomes differentiated. It separates, instead of just being a random mix, it heats so that the iron liquefies and it's being heavier, so it goes to the center. The less heavy materials are outside that iron core, which is now forming inside the asteroid here. And then finally, you have the crust. And the crust would be the least affected by the heat, uh, unless, of course, there was volcanic eruptions, which would spread lava over the surface. So chondrites basically go back to the original primitive materials of which meteorites form, or protoplanets formed. Iron meteorites represent the core, we believe, of asteroids. And given that fact that they represent a core, you have to think, man, to get that thing to Earth, that whole body had to be completely destroyed by an impact, by a collision, so that the chunks and the core would be exposed. Then we have the palisites, Again, kind of controversial about this, whether they form one way or another, but it's 
very likely that they form in the zone between the core and the mantle. So they're kind of a mix of silicates, which are the olivine crystals, those beautiful greens, and iron from the core. And then you have the achondrites, which represent mantle materials that have been heated to the point where the chondrules are gone or the uh, volcanic uh, eruptions have uh, the materials melted beneath the surface and then arrives on the surface through volcanic eruptions. So it's very altered from its original uh, mineral composition. So we get this picture of asteroid evolution by studying these samples that just arrived. They're like pieces of a puzzle or characters in a story. And when we get all the characters in and we hear all of their stories, we get a sense of the longer story that we too are a part of, this great evolution of the solar system, starting with dust from stars, from red giants, and ending up with this beautiful world that we live in. Uh, most common places to find meteorites, the deserts for obvious reasons, they're much better preserved there because of the dryness. Another great place to look for meteorites, wish we could, but you have to have special uh, privileges to do it as a scientist is Antarctica. Fascinating how it works in Antarctica. They're preserved in the ice. Here, can you find the meteorite in this photo? If you said here, you are correct. So each one, each flag represents a find there on the Antarctic ice field. It's so cool how it happens in Antarctica. You got all this ice and it's moving towards a mountain range. It's sloping, moving. And as it moves towards the range, there's powerful winds across the ice and the winds strip and oblate the ice and expose the rocks. And when they arrive at the mountains, you get a whole field of exposed meteorites along the mountainsides that have sort of been delivered there conveyor belt style and then stripped from the ice by the winds. So these are very rich meteorite hunting areas. Well, I don't expect you to go to Antarctica to get a meteorite, but if you are interested in getting a meteorite for yourself, or I find them they're great for contemplation. Uh, they're also, again, as I've mentioned several times, great uh, for public outreach. You can go to eBay. I know it seems shocking, you know, why do, should I really believe eBay? And the answer is there are good sellers there. There's a tremendous amount of garbage there also, much more than in the early days, 10 years ago or so. But amongst the garbage, you will find the gems. If you want to take a picture of this, you can. I went and just listed a number of sellers there on the left. Those are their handles. And you can look them up. And they're all, uh, if they're not members of the International Meteorite Collectors Association, which is a good thing to look for, but not necessary. Uh, they're all reliable, honest people. Obviously, it's always good to check feedback. They all have great feedback. So that's one way you can purchase a meteorite. This is a fairly recent page showing you uh, the Serico meteorite from Kenya. You get an idea of the price. Some are unbelievably inexpensive. You don't have to spend a fortune to own a meteorite. I like to go when I do online meteorite buying. There's a couple of my favorite places, Poland Met, this guy in Poland named Marcin, unbelievable. This guy just, he polishes that he's just a perfectionist. Beautiful, beautiful work. And then this fellow is named Eric and he is in Alaska, in Juneau at meteoritemarket.com. And he's had, I think his is the longest running meteorite sale website on the web. He's been there forever. I have some suggestions finally uh, at the end here for you of what to start with. What would be a good idea? Uh, I can suggest for you if you're looking for a basic collection, it'd be nice to have an iron nickel meteorite, right? That's one of the primary types or a, and then a stony chondrite uh, or, and a palisite. And among the iron nickel meteorites, the ones that are fairly affordable include Canyon Diablo, which is the meteorite crater in Arizona. There's also Campo del Cielo. You'll see a lot of those online. Here's an example. For a stony meteorite, I recommend NWA869 or Chelyabinsk. You can still buy Chelyabinsk on eBay, little stones. Um, I've got one here. There's a little, oh, there we go. See that little black rock? There's one. 
So that's an idea. Um, NWA, by the way, you're going to see a lot of NWAs when it comes to meteorites. This stands for Northwest Africa. And then the number is its classification number, 869. And Northwest Africa means it was found in the Sahara Desert, likely Morocco, Libya, possibly Mauritania, West Sahara, those, that northern region of Africa. So NWA, Northwest Africa. And finally, um, the relatively affordable palisites include Serico, which is from Kenya, a recent find there, and then Semchan from Russia. Uh, Semchan lasts, is a little more stable. Some meteorites are less stable than other meteorites. And I'm just going to stop my share here. Uh, some meteorites are less stable. They tend to rust more often than others. Semchan is more stable than Serico. Uh, here's, let's see if I got an example. I, I wanted to show you one other thing, a couple other things, uh, now that we're back to full screen. Uh, this is a piece of Vesta. I'll bring it in so it focuses. You see that? Nice shape there. There's not much metal in this, but this is an achondrite, and it has a really cool texture to it. And this is an NWA meteorite 7854. Uh, identified as coming from Vesta. And then one other thing I thought would be fun to show you guys is this. Remember the Park Forest meteorite I mentioned and the fellow who was almost struck, Noah Garza? This is a kit that a meteorite dealer sold for a while. He went to the people's home and he bought the hole in the roof and he had he paid them for their meteorites. He fixed, got the roof fixed, took care of everything, and gave him a whole bunch of money so that he could have that hole as part of an exhibit. And then we also have some examples of the glass and plaster and wood from the hole in the roof. And then there's a tiny piece right here, right at the tip of my fingernail of the meteorite. So that would be a meteorite impact kit. That's from the Who Pay brothers uh, who were quite the sellers and dealers in meteorites some years ago. Well, I hope I haven't, I hope you, I hope this has been interesting for you. And I'm certainly open to questions if you have any about meteorites. Uh, I have a few questions. Feel free. Um, yeah. What was the other inclusion on the meteorite that had the aluminum uh, inclusions on them? It was maybe three, three or four slides back. Oh, uh, it, yeah, it almost kind of, looked like a rusty iron yeah, it, 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 to me, it looked like there was some iron uh, in there, Tony. Um, I don't know specifically what it was, but I wouldn't be surprised because those meteorites also contain iron in them too. It, it's found in so many types of chondrites. Uh, yeah, if you see that rusty red, that's a good sign. One thing meteorites are not, uh, they rarely ever show, are holes. And a lot of people will bring to you a sample and go, I'm sure this is a meteorite because it's got all these melted holes in it. But meteorites don't melt that way. They form thumbprints, you know, where the softer materials heat up and ablate as they move through the atmosphere. But rarely do you have the holes that you see in man-made slag. That's full of holes. So the most commonly mistaken materials for meteorites are slag. Uh, Bob, what is the best way to take care of iron meteorites? Oh, there you've got one. Is that a Sakoti? Yeah, yeah. That's um, how has it been? How has it been behaving for you? Uh, fine. I keep it in a dome with uh, the desiccant crystals and wipe it with a rag after I touch it. But uh, it's doing fine. That's you're doing just the right thing. Um, you're taking care of it that way. You wipe off the oils. You keep it in a dome with some desiccant. That is actually the best way to do it. If you run into a problem, I know that gun people use gun oil sometimes to refresh a meteorite. Occasionally, a meteorite will develop a small rusty spot, like uh, this Campo del Cielo gets a little bit of rust once in a while. And then I just take a piece of sandpaper and I get rid of it that way. Hmm. But best ways to keep them clean. Uh, when it's humid out, I keep mine in a place where I've got little dehumidifiers. You ever see those portable dehumidifiers? Yeah. You just charge them up in the wall. They've got desiccant in them. And then you set that inside. So that tends to preserve. Uh, that said, Chuck, there are some meteorites that no matter how hard you try, 
<laughs> they got water in them. And you, I mean, and it's all the way inside and it will actually sweat water. I've had meteorites, I've kept them as dry as possible and then they'll get these little oily beads on them from just water that comes out from inside that got in there long wow. ago. Well, this one's behaved great. I've had it about eight or nine years and it's maybe actually longer and it's the yeah. same as the yeah, I got it. So, but I've taken care yeah. of it. Yeah, just a, a good care of it. I've, um, Here's another example. This is a Canyon Diablo too. Uh, can you can you mm. see the Whitman-Stetton pattern there? Oh yeah, sure. It's a little it's a little glary, but uh, this one has been coated. Sometimes people would will put a you can get a wax type coating, a thin thin wax, and that could be helpful. I wouldn't coat it in lucite or anything like that because you could trap. No, no the oxides in there and the water and it just could go to heck on you but um, a little wax coating occasional cleanup is good with sandpaper you've done well with that piece it looks great mm -hmm. uh, bob that uh, that pattern that you just showed in that uh, meteor uh, meteorite um what causes that is that from when the meteorite is formed or is that from when it enters the atmosphere and it heats up and creates that pattern? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, what it is, it, that's a, how it actually forms that pattern. And that pattern forms because that's how the atoms, the iron and nickel atoms connect and align themselves into crystals, kind of the same way water becomes a crystal when you freeze it. Uh, you've got cooling happening inside the core of that little asteroid, and it forms a crystal structure. So that that goes way back to the beginning, you know, of the formation. That said, occasionally, uh, through impacts, meteorites, iron meteorites, can develop sort of bizarre patterns because they've been reheated later during an impact, and then that will twist or change the Woodman-Stetton pattern. So that shows up too on occasion. Uh, does anybody in the group here own a meteorite? Outside of Chuck. Oh, you do. Okay. So I guess you guys, yeah, you have, um, what do you have? If I can ask. Um, let me grab, hang on just a minute. Okay. Mine's from the okay. China impact. From which one now? It's a Cote Aline and a Campbell, I believe, is my other one. Yeah, yeah, those are great to have. Do you guys, I assume you probably, you know, I didn't know exactly who who would be in the group tonight, but I assume you probably bring those out to the public too, so people can handle the meteorites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. My the uh, Those are good examples too, because it's, I think that weight that people feel, that heaviness is, is sort of a nice thing. It makes an impression. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, but you, but uh, one thing that is nice to have is a, uh, a witness fall, too. Of course, Sakoti is like that. But uh, if you can get a little stony Chelyabinsk meteorite, that's a, a wonderful thing. Oh, what, here we have something from David. What is that? This is from the uh, Gangdong uh, China Impact. Um, tektite. Oh, it's a tektite. Okay. Yeah, that of course is a different type of material. That's actually, you know, of course, you you know, that's not a meteorite. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some tektites are. I I really enjoy tektites too. I didn't bring those into the talk tonight because they're not meteorites, but they do form by impact and they have some of the most amazing shapes you can ever imagine. I mean, there are teardrop shaped ones. You know, they've obviously been affected aerodynamically. They've been shaped, you know, as they dropped through the air at high speed. Oh, Chuck Allen's got something here. Oh, that's a nice one there too, Scott. Is that a Sakoti? Yeah. Okay, and that's the, that must be a Campo. Yeah. Yeah, it's they're they're very enjoyable, and they uh, they kind of are one of the few things in astronomy that can 
directly that you can hold, you know, that came from the sky, uh, which I like. I, I can't wait until someone, oh, wait, we got another one here. Chuck Allen has a what? Is that? What is that? Is that a palisite? Is that, it looks like a palisite. Yeah. A very good example from what I can see. Yeah, that's a nice, that's a good palisite. Um, if you don't own a palisite but would like one, you have to be a little careful on eBay. Uh, there are some sellers selling them from China and it's unclear. Sometimes they'll say they're from the United States, but they're actually in China. So it's a little unclear what's going on there. I just took my first chance this week and purchased a small one and we'll see how it goes. A small uh, Serico Palisite, which are very inexpensive right now on eBay. So, and you can get a fairly large one too if you don't own one uh, and not pay a lot of money. But yeah, it's just fun to, fun to be able to have them and share them and think about where they came from. And it, it's cool that you guys have them too. Do you have any other questions about that or anything else? It can be unrelated as well. Oh, we have another meteorite coming. Chuck, if, check, oh, wow. Check, check, is it working, Chuck? We can't hear you. Can't hear you. <clears throat> yeah, while we're waiting for Chuck, I, I must be way off of Bob's screen because Apparently he can't see me. But... I can see you. Okay. Yeah, I can see you now really well. Yeah. Yeah. This is a this is an L6 chondrite. This is the a piece a slice of the the Lushton fall from 1914, and this is the only meteorite that was ever brought to me that turned out not to be a meteor wrong. And uh, I identified this meteorite fall in uh, 1982 and promptly sold it. Uh, well, actually I didn't sell it. Uh, I, I hooked the uh, owner up with uh, a meteorite collector and uh, he made arrangements to buy it. And uh, I had to go on the market to buy my own slice years later, but our museum got a nice slice and uh, we got a nice replica and Glenn Husk was uh, very generous and uh, giving us a big piece at the museum, so. Well, that's really good. That's a great story. I've only heard of Lushton. I certainly don't have a slice of that. That's that's a rare one to have. You you want to know the whole story? It's real short. Of so course. 1982, <laughs> woman walks into my office, plunks down, uh, I don't know, like, a, like an eight pounder on my desk and said, dad said this was a meteorite. He used it as a doorstop in the barn while us kids were growing up. Dad died last year. What is it? The kids want to know. And uh, I said, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you, I followed yeah. up and it was true. Uh, he plowed it up out of the field in the lush to Nebraska. Uh, oh. 1914 as a child. <laughs> Just a classic. So many, so many meteorites have been plowed up like that. And that's got to be at least the third or fourth story I've heard about them being used as doorstops. Yeah, they made a great doorstop in the barn. That's what the kids said. <laughs> dad said it was a meteorite. Kids didn't believe their dad. You should always believe your dad. Uh, you have, I Chuck? tell my daughters that. I always tell my daughters that. <laughs> Chuck, you had another one. Well, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened to the mic there. No, I was just asking about uh, some of these uh, the common lucite. Oh yeah, what is uh, what kind is that? Let me see if I can get it a little closer. Yeah, can you feature them, um, Tony? Can you put them on the featured screen? Or maybe I need to change my view. Or maybe if I talk, it'll. Yeah. I'm the host. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a little out of focus, it. but you can sure see it's okay. a palace light. Yeah. It's hard to tell when, what the light is doing here on the screen. But... 
Yeah, I know what you mean. Anyway, it, it came in loose sight, but it, I kind of liked it. It was pretty. So, what kind of meteorite is it? What is the the name? Uh, I'm, I'd have to look it up. I don't have it handy. It's all packed away. Yeah. Is it okay. Neat. Yeah, those are the ones that you most often see on eBay right now are the lucite coated uh, Saracho meteorites from Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, hard to say what the longevity of that those are going to be, but sometimes if the price is right, it's worth you know trying it. I should have brought more meteorites up. I've got certainly enough to show you, but I've got a couple of lunars as well. Uh, this is really a great time for the lunar meteorites. Does, uh, is anyone here in the group, a member of the Facebook group, the Meteorite and Tech Type group by Mendy Uzalu? Does that ring a bell with anyone? If you're on Facebook at all, you visit it, it's really worth to get into the feed of that because it's a great place to ask meteorite questions. And it's also, there's a lot of different experts there and it's a good place to see different kinds of meteorites. And also people will sell material there too, within the group. And it's sometimes quite inexpensive or they'll introduce a new lunar meteorite, for instance. And the prices can be really affordable. I mean, it used to be, uh, those who bought meteorites years ago, if you tried to get a thin slice of the moon or a tiny nugget, it was like $10,000 a grain. Whereas these days you can, uh, get a lunar meteorite slice for about $40 a gram. So it's quite affordable and really a fun thing to have and share. But I can get you the, I'll tell you what, I am gonna get the link to that and I will put it in the chat box, all right? Do that right now. And we're just about there. And we are there. So here it is. And there's, I, I think there's maybe a half a dozen groups on Facebook, but this one uh, you need to be a member of. So he's probably gonna ask you a question or something and you'll answer that and then you'll be a member. And then you'll get to see these posts. And again, they're quite informative, I think. I think it would be a good resource. Anyone else there have resources they use that they might want to share that maybe I'm not aware of? I'll just add in that when the meteor men uh, series was going, I was uh, always tuned in to that. I know there was some drama, but uh, it was a very interesting show. <laughs> Nonetheless. Nonetheless, hey, those are sure. great guys. Both of those guys are wonderful. Back in the day, they used to have a party at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. They Because they had birthdays on the same date or almost the same date. So they had this big party. And so generous with their time. This is before the whole series started, the meteorite men. But uh, uh, Tony, have anyone been to the Gem and Mineral Show? Because that is the place to go for meteorites too, live. Chef, Sorry. Yes. Uh, can I share a screen for just a moment? Yes. OK. Uh, I know a, a, a friend of mine in Russia was in Chelly events during the impact. Uh, when it exploded in the air, and uh, it was actually nearly hit by some broken glass coming down from a building on a sidewalk. He was walking there with his girlfriend, and he posted something right afterwards to show you that Russians do have a sense of humor. Let's see here if I'll share a screen. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I've I've got nearly that same that same uh, a same photo of that near Berlin Berlin where the uh, where the wall fell. 
So I actually have a piece of the wall if, if, that's, a, if that's a fall as well. You just don't see that kind of thing being posted by Russians in Moscow very often. <laughs> that's where it lives now. So. Yeah, it was fascinating that fall, uh, especially when they fished that giant, you know, the main mass of the meteorite. They got it out of Lake Chabarco. Yeah. And that beautiful, like, perfectly round hole in the ice. And they finally got down there and they hauled that thing up and it busted, broke the scale. I can't remember how many kilograms it weighed, but many. Uh, but so many of those meteorites are just small. They're like gravel from, you know, that tremendous impact with the atmosphere. The, the videos yes, and are sometimes if you're someone named Behringer, you try to find a big chunk of iron and you just drill and drill. Yeah, that's before we knew what we know now, you know, that most of that thing is gone, basically. It turned into iron droplets, so. Yeah, no main mass there exactly. I find it fascinating, and you could do a whole program on this too, of all the meteorites that have been found on Mars, where they positively, I mean, you could even, if you, if you looked at iron meteorites, you could even look at the photos and go, well, that has to be a meteorite because it has the regnic glyphs on it. And I can't remember what the number is at now, but it's at least a half a dozen meteorites that have been found on Mars, iron ones, iron nickel. Oh. Mike, did you dig up another treasure to show us? You're muted. Got this one from uh, Australia. Yeah. And it says it's, uh, let's see here, from the Nullarbor Plain. It's an iron medium octahedrite with sulfide and silicate inclusions. And it was found in 1966. And what is it? What's the name? Um, it says it's a, <laughs> and I'm not sure if I, I'm pronouncing this right, a Mundra Billa. Mundra Billa, you bet. That's a famous one. That's a good sample to have. A wonderful name, too. And Null Arbor Plain is one of the best named things ever. Does anybody know what that means? Take a guess. What is it the means term? No Null arbor. So uh, something no, corkscrewed. No trees. <laughs> no trees. <laughs> no trees. It means, it means no trees. It's in the desert. There's no trees there. <laughs> Null arbor. <laughs> oh, that's great. I feel like I should go downstairs now and grab some more meteorites, but I don't want to, you know, take too much of your guys' time. Mm -hmm. The, uh, is, does anybody, uh, is anyone here interested in fluorescent, uh, UV fluorescent light and fluorescence? I, I was at one time when I was somewhat uh, exposed to the fact that, you know, you go out with a UV light at night, you can find all kinds of luminescent uh, uh, geological items. Um, yes. And so now I'm retired and maybe that's something I could do, you know. Yeah, uh, it's. It, it is fun to do. There's certain places you can go. But in regards to meteorites, there are some meteorites that are that fluoresce. And I was playing around the other day with my uh, long wave UV flashlight. And I've got a couple of achondrites. I don't, I don't have any chondrites. They don't seem to fluoresce at all. But the achondrites have the right minerals in them, it seems, to fluoresce. So that's kind of fun, too. I want to spend a little bit more time and, doing that. That's the meteorite also. Say again. The Vesta meteorite. Yeah, it's a Vesta meteorite. I don't think Vesta. I'm on my main my main microphone right now. So if you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, okay, I can hear you. I, we can hear you. You're a little broken, but we can hear yeah. you. Uh, uh, 
So of course, VEST is not the obviously not the only parent body. There are some other parent bodies for some of these achondrites too. But many of the you know the achondrites are divided into these eukrites, howardites, diogenites. Many of those types uh, come from Vesta, but there are other parent bodies. I don't know the total number that they've identified, but it is fascinating to see that we're starting to reach out now, and especially with these missions to asteroids where we're sample return missions, we can, I can't wait till we get the results on the Bennu asteroid and also on Ryuku, the Japanese one, to see how closely they match particular carbonaceous chondrites here on the earth, you know, just to cement that connection or are they different? Are they uh, different in, unexpected ways. You so know when the exciting. return dates are? It's a couple of years yet, is it not? Yeah, it's September 2023 for the NASA mission. And the Japanese mission has already returned. And it's obviously carbonaceous material. Uh, but I have not, there are no results that I've seen published yet. I did try to look those up before this presentation, but I couldn't find. I found some photos and that was about it. I do know that from their first mission, Hayabusa 1, that they did find that, you know, the little bit of dust that they found, they picked up, it was a chondrite type dust. I think it was a low metal or an LL chondrite that was discovered within that first mission. That would have been the asteroid Itakawa. So, but keep sending those probes out there and bringing this stuff back. It's just fantastic. Is the delay the due to? Just... Go ahead, Chuck. Sorry. I don't. There is there. It must be a delay. I'm sorry, Tony. I said the Bennu mission just left Bennu in May, so it's just now starting its way back. Yeah, yeah. Chuck's right. It's just a, it's a matter of time and getting here from the asteroid belt. So, and then they're going to drop the capsule. They have to do just this perfect maneuver so it doesn't burn up in the atmosphere, and it lands safely on the Earth. Looking forward to it. Where is it scheduled to land? You know, I want to say it's in Utah, but I'm not a hundred percent. I think that's, I think that's right. I think it's Utah. No, it rings a bell. Yeah. I'm still waiting for one of those missions. You know, one of the unplanned missions to land in my yard. That's what I want. I want to see a <laughs> meteorite. I kind of, I don't know about you guys, but I'm always kind of looking at rocks just in case. And I did find one chunk of metal that was suspicious, brought it to Tucson, had some guy tested for nickel. It had maybe some nickel. He couldn't give me a definitive. All I walked out with was it might be a meteorite. So I have no idea what I have. But every, unlike, who was it? Uh, was it not Michael, who had the Lush, Lufkin? Anyway. Uh, people have brought me meteorites and sent me lots of photos and I've yet to see one where I can say, yep, that's the real item. I think meteorite men made it seem, that series made it seem like they were really common. And of course, they're really uncommon and tough to find in climates like Indiana or Minnesota. Yeah, closest I've gotten to one falling in my yard, I was taking the no, I was getting ready to leave for work. It was like five in the morning and I looked up in the uh, in, in the western sky and just was looking up at constellations and I noticed a star that wasn't supposed to be there and the star got brighter and brighter and brighter. And I, at first I thought, oh my gosh, am I watching a supernova? But then, uh, you know, it flashed out, so to speak. Ah. And I <laughs> must have been in line of sight with something coming into our atmosphere. So. That would have been a good one. You know, yeah, that, well, it didn't that's, a good that's, that's the one you want. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you, you guys have had to explain to people that it's very common for people to say that it just fell over the other ridge or the other house or the barn or whatever. Um, I always explain to people, if you can see the meteor in the air, that thing is at least 70 miles high and whatever horizontal distance away from you. So it's probably like 300 miles away. And then once it goes out where you can't see the meteor anymore, there's approximately like 25 miles of dark flight 
where it's cooled down enough so it shows no trail. There's no more ionization happening. And during the dark flight of the meteorite, winds could be pushing it this way or that. So it won't necessarily land here, but it could land way over there, way over there. So it's very hard to say, oh, it landed over there. So I try to explain off 